go to Facebook, I go to Wikipedia, then suddenly I'm getting ads for feet on my Facebook. Big oh. feet, big foot, big farmer. So <laughs> the original association is always that guys with big feet have big dicks, okay? Hang on with me here. I know some of, some of you are screaming, pause, but <laughs> hold on. Why aren't we calling Bigfoot the big cock monster? For the SCP watchers, this was something that was recommended to me. So uh, perhaps we should, we should check that one too. But... Oh, a new incognito mode vid. Oh my god. Uh, that 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 is that's obvious. We need to watch that then. Okay, even fancier paintings. Ooh. Okay, so um, my knowledge of certain paintings and art is not the broadest in the world, but I do know some stuff. Okay, so in that note, ladies and gentlemen, we have. Yet another video on the fancy arc by the internet historian, this time on paintings. The thing that we've all tried to doodle as kids, but we never truly achieved the level of the mainstream artist. I suppose that we're gonna go with a lot of like... Uh, classic art and not so much of like Banksy territory, because that's not fancy enough. That's a bit too uh, weird and abstract for a lot of people to enjoy. But <laughs> middle class, ew. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not about that. But I'm not about to change to, to my clothing today to look more fancy, okay? We're doing this in a hoodie because we are cultured men. The most cultured thing that you can ever wear is hoodie. And unfortunately, I don't have sweatpants today. <laughs> but yeah, the most fancy thing are suit pants because I actually was doing something important today. But anyways, let us jump into this video by the internet historian on paintings. And isn't like the other girls. Hello, incognito mode videos now. All right, so the schedule for this mini series goes like this. We did the main channel on theater, then an incognito mode on painting, which is this. Then there's a main channel on wine, and then an incognito mode on a bunch of stories around wine. And there's a main channel on things that people wear, there's a main channel on luxury goods, and then we round the whole thing off with two more incognito modes. Okay, so for the wine video, I don't know what he's going to do, but uh, <laughs> it's going to be based because I have a stepdad who is like a bigger nerd than I can ever be. So some of you think that I have an expand, like a, a pretty vast knowledge about certain things, but... The reason why I am as knowledgeable as I am is mostly because of him. Because he grew up, at least we grew up in our household with like a notion of you don't need to be an expert at something necessarily, but be as good as many things as you can. That's why I always try to like jump into as many hobbies as possible because I had the opportunity to and I feel very blessed for having had that. But... Because of all of those things, I got to learn about a lot of shit. But he, oh my god, he's a fucking nerd. And when it comes to wine, I've been bombarded with like theories and things about cultivation. He, <laughs> because of my mom's health, it's actually not like a joking matter, to be totally fair here. Uh, but my parents had to move to Spain because my mom has a pulmonary infection that causes her to have like 47 no 37 percent of lung capacity it's very bad but living in that warm climate they are in an area where they actually can cultivate their own stuff fruit vegetables and my man old man decided to jump into wine <laughs> like you have to stop your hobbies dad don't be that much. It's gonna be an extremely paused video because I have a rather vast knowledge about that area. Anyways, let's continue. And then I go back into cryostasis. This first section is on the basics of painting. And we were a little bit worried to show it because we, we kind of felt like this will split the audience. Not because it's political or anything, but because <laughs> it's so basic. 
So someone who already knows something about art would be like, yeah, of course, why are you telling me this? But for someone like me, who knows practically zero about art, mm. I found it really interesting. And I thought, where the heck haven't I been told this before, right? So, first section. I think it's important to always remember like things like nomenclature or like the basics of denotations for certain things. So it's it's not bad to remind even experts on stuff how the basics are because it is is literally a phenomenon named after a scientist a, a German scientist that when you are an expert at certain things you become so very dull at the basic stuff. Hi, this is the voice of editing Jack here. Just adding a little bit of that graphical goodness to the video and also correcting myself when I made a mistake. The phenomenon or effect that I was talking about here is called the Einstellung effect. And it was not coined by a German scientist, but rather a Polish-American couple by the name of Edith and Abraham Lukens. The German scientist, in fact, that I was thinking of was Albert Einstein, who got fooled by a couple of these two. But that's a bit more of a longer story, but just for the sake of correction, bye. It's, it's literally a thing, so you shouldn't be, feel bad about explaining basics of paintings to even professionals. Basics of painting. Action! The arts. The arts. Do not put an F in front of that worst mistake I ever made in my life. <laughs> right, first, some things that'll make you go, yeah, mm. and, or, oh, right. Yeah. So look at this colorful goo. Paint, delicious in both jam and chip form. Ooh. But its raw components are just two essential things. Egg yolk. <laughs> An undissolving pigment and a medium. Now, pigments are basically just colorful dust and the medium is the liquidy thing that the dust hangs out in. Mm -hmm. Now, the liquid determines what type of paint you have. Pigment plus water equals watercolors. Pigment say. plus glue equals acrylics. Pigment plus oil equals oil paints. So simple. And pigment right. plus... Moving on. Now, the pigment does not dissolve into the medium. Instead, it's just kind of suspended in it. When the pigment does dissolve into a medium, that's a dye. We call a that dye. a dye. So that's yeah. the basic difference. Now, you have to transfer the paint onto the canvas. To do that, we need to talk tools. Well, first, you can just use your fingers. It was good enough for the cavemen, and it's good enough for your mom. So it's good <laughs> enough for us. Then we tried brushes. Now, here is the anatomy of a brush. People who have never seen the Jackson Pollock painting may wonder how those ones are made. <laughs> I'm not going to explain that innuendo. You'll have to figure it out for yourself. You've got the handle, the bristles, the ferrule, and the crimp. Okay. Now, the bristles are the most important bit. First, we were just using mangled up reeds called fronds. But they got really good once we started using animal, animal hair. Have a look at some of the animals we used. Boar, taken from the neck or the back of the pig. Ooh. That is the kind of brush that Van Gogh used and it's still the gold standard for today. A goat brush. It's good, but it's not the goat. Lacks some spring, so it's mostly used for calligraphy. Badger. Now that's actually mostly used for shaving, not painting at all. Horse, raccoon, and wolf, also not great. <laughs> Shows a freaking furry. That's typical. But from what I'm aware of, the best should be that of uh, not a squirrel, no, <laughs> it's a fun little story. In the past, squirrel hair, or at least squirrel hair brushes, used to be the thing used to apply gold leaf on, for, for example, furniture. They used to use uh, squirrel hair to make that. And yeah, squirrels literally had a better job than most peasants for some time <laughs> during the Middle Ages. And of course, la later uh, eras. But yeah, I think the, the the biggest scam that we've never been told has been that of camel hair. That one is fucked up because we think that the most the cheapest brushes that we can get are made out of camel hair when they're actually not. They are made out of cat hair. Yeah, <laughs> but that we can't sell that knowing that oh, 
our pets are being abused <laughs> for the sake of, well, not abused, but these are being the ones who provide the hair for those brushes. <laughs> Great quality. But what's the worst quality of all? You know, the gutter oil of the brush world. Well, the worst quality is camel hair brushes. Oh, and there we go. And they're sold as arts and crafts brushes for kids. But the weird thing is, camel hair is so low quality that it's not even used in brushes at all. Mm-hmm. Huh? Because yes, these cats. So-called camel hair brushes are actually made from cats and rabbits and squirrels. <laughs> Who mentioned the dark urge squirrel being yeeted before? There you go. You've been placed. <laughs> Jesus Christ. He had to come like whiplash. <laughs> But that makes people kind of sad. So they changed the name to a much less cute animal and also one that's kind of exotic, so you wouldn't question it. Now, what's the best brush of all? What is the S tier of brushes? Those are made from sable. Oh my god, this oh. is the worst. 10 out of 10. Now, sable is a type of Aww. weasel. These are hunted for their fur for clothing. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Well, at least it's not an Afghani child. It's him. But when they catch them to make clothes, they actually only want the body for the clothes. And so they discard the tail altogether. But those tails have the best hair for paintbrushes. Mm. And so they are snatched up by the brush makers. Now, the hair is special because it has an interlocking scales that vastly increases the surface area. Nice. But it also holds strong in the long term. Firm and bouncy, but also soft. It's smooth, it bounces, it moves. Only with new Tresemme Keratin Smooth. And they sell for upwards of $300 a brush. $300? Ouch. All right, here's a top 10 list, sort of maybe Watch Mojo style, of the most famous paintings and just a few interesting things about them that you may not know. Okay. Pop quiz, sports shoe wearer. Look at this painting. Jackson Pollock. What does it make you feel? <laughs> the meme one? Jizz. <laughs> Too late. Or if you answered in time, wrong answer. Happy, sad. I bet those are the only two emotions you even know. Perplexed. The correct answer is shame, because you are embarrassing yourself. You know nothing about the art. <laughs> oh. So it is time to look at the best paintings to ever exist. <laughs> He's not going to try to sneak the Darth Vader there for the starry night without us noticing. <laughs> God damn it. Okay, so we kick it off with the Mona Lisa. Okay. And let's begin with the most obscure of them all. Whoever this is. Ah, uh, the Mona Lisa. Now, I thought it went first name Mona, last name Lisa. Check it out. Lady Pretend Lisa. Out, Mona is an honorific, meaning madam. So oh, madam. Yeah. Madam Lisa. Yeah. Now, relatively recently, historians have figured out who she actually is. And they I found know. out that she's married to a Florentine merchant. Francesco del Giacondo. We made a joke about that. Some friends and I, when we discovered this, we were actually to a museum, um, of a Da Vinci museum in uh, Milan, where we got to see the, the, the freaking painting, where somebody made, because we got information about her life, and some said that it was akin to Marie Kondo, because the Giocondo was there. And it was perfect because she has the whole meme of her saying, this does not spark joy. Because Mona Lisa is not exactly joyful. It's kind of ambiguous what her expression actually is. So that makes her Lisa del Gioconda. And that explains the alternative title of the work, La Gioconda. Now the reason she has her arms crossed and is a little bit chubby is because she's pregnant. In fact, you can kind of see that she's wearing a veil. And mm. that particular type of veil was worn by pregnant women at the time. Her husband okay. commissioned the painting when da Vinci was already well known. So it would have been very expensive. And that makes it very funny for a couple of reasons. One, it was never handed over to the family. Instead, Leo left it in his will to his apprentice. And two, Ooh. because for a couple of hundred years, the prevailing theory was that she was not an aristocratic wife, but instead... A prostitute. A prostitute. Yeah. 
Her hair being down and her almost absent eyebrows were common traits of working girls at the time. Anyway, why is this painting so famous? Well, da Vinci was already pretty famous and the painting got stolen. This mm -hmm. became a very big news story and her face suddenly started getting plastered on a whole bunch of newspapers and wanted posters, making her very recognizable. From there, she became the most famous painting, which is why she always looks so smug. <laughs> Starry Night, Vincent van Gogh. Yeah, I Norway. Sure hope it does. Painted while he was in the St. Paul de Musol Asylum. That's here. And this was the view from his bedroom window. Here is the real view a few decades later. He chose not to paint the metal bars. Now, you can see that there are 11 stars in the sky here. Yeah, the Supposedly, that's reference to Joseph from the Bible. Joseph, he had a hard life. Oh, oh. I, I had a completely different interpretation of it. Joseph from the Bible actually makes a lot more sense with his life of suffering and then being put in an asylum. Gee. He might have been a doomer, but he was well justified. Minivan, he had a hard life too. And he hoped that he would be remembered at least once he was gone. Like Joseph. And you know what? It worked out for him because everybody remembers Van Gogh and nobody remembers the guys who bullied him and called him a ginger. Also, there's kind of a theory that he was killed by some kid. Go check out Wendigoon's channel for more information on that one. Ah, the okay. birth of Venus. All right, let me tell you what's happening in this one. So there's this lady, Venus. She is the goddess of, of beauty. beauty. And she is coming up out of the ocean in a big clam, right? Now, the clam is it's not, not a, a metaphor a... for her vagina. No. It's that she is the perfect pearl. pearl. Get it? Yeah. Now, these two here are a divine wind. They are blowing her like a hot spoonful of soup towards the shore. And she is carried all the way over to the beach. And this beach, by the way, is a real place. And then she's giving Pathos. Cyprus. It's in Cyprus. Now, when she arrives on the beach, a nymph shows up, which is this lady here, and she has a cloak. And she throws the cloak over Venus and she says, You know what? You're very special. One day they're going to name a four blade razor after you. <laughs> Arrangement in black and grey number one. Also known as Whistler's Mother. Most famous for its appearance Mr. in the Bean. Mr. Bean movie. Yeah. Now, when Whistler's mother originally agreed to be painted, she, she agreed was lying to be down. painted standing up. But she had to pose for so long that eventually she got quite tired and had to sit down. Okay. There you go. And that became the famous pose. The Garden of Earthly Delights. All right, this one is probably my favorite because it looks like a Where's Waldo. In the yeah, this one is nice. It's for... Why are you not fans in the video? Well, because we're on the stream, I decided not to change clothing. Well, we'll have to do that for the next one. But this this painting is kind of special for those of us who studied a bit of theology. It gets represented a lot, at least mentioned a lot in many contexts. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of weird because not only does it does it depict the Garden of Eden, it also kind of assert flat earth and hollow earth theory. It's so freaking weird. But of course, those are the thoughts of the people back then. So, yeah. Find Adam and Eve in all of this. Three delights. All right. This one is probably my favorite because it looks like a Where's Waldo and then the whole thing just goes completely off the rails. So, Mr. Hieronymus. That's a name that's going to make a comeback. <laughs> is doing all of this cool surreal stuff about 500 years ago. So let's start on the left. Here is Adam and Eve and the pre-incarnation of Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> and they are all hanging out in the Garden of Eden. Now what's going on in the middle bit? That's harder yeah. to explain. The best theory is either that yeah, this is Eden before if people were allowed back into the garden. The original or if sin. They never left in the first place. Or if man had not committed original sin. But look at the size of that strawberry. <laughs> oh, here he is. Then on the right-hand panel is hell. Yeah. Or at least a very bad time. This is where Oddlaw would end up. That son of a bitch. Right. Now, here's the interesting bit. It's not painted on Folded. a typical canvas. It's actually a sort of cabinet thing with three panels called a triplet. And the neat thing is, if you close the doors, more painting. That is the earth. And that is the firmament. 
A perfect balance between flat earth and globe theory. There we go. A Sunday afternoon on the island. Yeah, did you did you not know the there's beta Jesus? <laughs> there's alpha Jesus. There's Omega LOL Jesus. AR Jesus is my favorite that I've got to learn about through watching some of the uh, <laughs> gun videos. You pick your version. My favorite is one uh, from the anime of uh, Jesus and Buddha hanging out together. Of Lagrange. This thing is pretty big, and here's the real-life place it was painted after. Although they've beautified it even more with the office building at the back. What you may not know is that it is actually a sequel. First, George Surratt painted the left bank, and that's where all the working class sit. You see these guys that, you know, have a bit less money and stuff. Gross. Peasants. <laughs> and then this is the one that you all know, and that is on the right-hand bank. And all these people are a very bougie sort. Yeah. That is scrappy do. And that that's a monkey. The last supper. Okay. So the Actually, you know what? <laughs> Base take, this is one of my favorite paintings of all time. It's amazing. <laughs> because it just shows just how awesome Jesus was. It was like bitches. <laughs> One of you is going to betray me today, and I'm gonna literally die. So get away from me. The scene is this. Another one, sassy Jesus. All the disciples are gathered around, and this is the exact moment that Jesus declares, Hey, by the way, I know one of you betrayed me. <laughs> and this is everyone's shocked reaction to the news. Except there's one guy who's just pretending to be shocked. And fucking femboy John. Bruh. <laughs> this is not this is not a servant. This is not Mary Magdalene that just came by or whatever to wash Jesus' feet. No, that's John. You know, the one who wrote the book of Revelation? Freaking apocalyptic dude. Yeah, that's him. And here is who everyone is. I thought this was Mary, by the way. Turns out that's John. <laughs> Very progressive. <laughs> and that's all of the painters, and no one has attempted one since. Yeah, G <laughs> Judas was the original <laughs> Among Us player. And I wake up. Quickly, flip the Nord logo, Mariana Stretch. Flip it the other way, three pyramids. He's solving the mystery. There's not much time. I gotta log into NordVPN so the corporations can't track me. Marketing companies oh. gang stalking me, listening to me through the walls. We found the death note. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wake up again. I don't have much time. The feds are at my door. Open up. I refuse to take my Nord milk pills. I wake up again. The demon in the corner of my room wants to access my NordVPN. I let him, because I can use it on up to. <laughs> John was a Doomer fanboy. <laughs> you could have fit perfectly in the chat in 4chan. Holy shit. Six different devices. Thanks, Nordman. I know the corporations are building profiles on me. I go to Facebook. I go to Wikipedia. Then suddenly, I'm getting ads for feet on my Facebook. Big oh. feet, big foot, big farmer. <laughs> on Tuesday, I saw a red car. Coincidence? <laughs> Huge deal on a two-year plan, plus four bonus months. Four sides to a triangle. Coincidence? There's a guy reacting to my life in the corner right now. 30 day money back guarantee. What's the goddamn catch? Time's going faster than usual and only a limited time to get a great deal on a two year plan. I wake up again. It's the perfect Christmas present. Who are you? Wait a minute. My family died in a suspicious house fire. Skinwalker in my house. Change location to Finland. Holy shit. This is different chaotic. Different have different prices on plane tickets and hotels. That ain't even a conspiracy. I take more microplastic so I can see through the ether. We're coming in your man. <laughs> Pizza time. But they're too late. I click Hyperborea and I am untouchable. Wow. If you understood anything that happened in this ad, go to nordvpn.com slash incognito <laughs> to get a huge deal on a two-year plan plus four bonus months. So <laughs> the original association is always that guys with big feet have big dicks. Okay. Hang on with me here. I know some of, some of you are screaming pause, but hold on. Why aren't we calling Bigfoot the big cock monster? Just asking. Add over. All right, so this one is about how to spot a fake painting. I quite like this section, but it kind of got bogged down by all of its technical information, and it went quite long. So here it is for the discerning audience. How to spot a fake painting. 
No, we are. <laughs> glug, glug, glug. Oh my god. Is that a real Michelangelo? <laughs> We're here now. Quick hypothetical lower tax brackets. If paintings like this one or this one go for literally gajillions of dollars, that's right. USD, then what's to stop someone from doing this? Nothing. Then this. And then this. <laughs> then this. And then saying it's real. Well, that's literally one of the most popular fakers in the world has like a ton of his art in the biggest museums like the Louvre Raven without people even knowing it. So yeah, there's nothing stopping them to, to do that. When it ain't. You know, faking a painting. Turns out, not much at all. In fact, it can be very difficult to tell these fake ass paintings from the ones that keep it real. There's a whole ass art to detecting these fakes, and it's become an arms race. CSI. The authenticators find new ways of detecting, and the fakers find new ways to get around their methods. Technology's advanced. Do you think that makes it harder to make good forgeries? No, you can beat the forensics. So, authentication. There are three mm. main categories. Provenance, connoisseurship, and forensic. forensics. Okay. Let's start in alphabetical order. Provenance. Now, provenance follows the history of a painting, tracking down the previous sellers and the buyers, all the galleries that exhibited it, the yeah. hand to hand that it was passed through, all the way back to the original painter. Leo! However, the older the work, the harder it is, generally, to track the provenance. Take, mm. for example, the most expensive painting ever sold, <sighs> the Salvatore Mundi, the final Da Vinci. Sold yeah. in 2017 for $400 million. And it can only be traced back to 1958. Holy shit, wait, 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 wait. Who was it that owned it? Million dollars. And it can only be traced. Yeah, of course he was. Good old Saudi prince. <laughs> back to 1958. Back then, it was sold for 45 pounds. But in the other 500 years of its history, no one knew where this thing was. <laughs> Even today, people still dispute whether it's genuine. I think it's a real flim flam. And this <laughs> is a made up piece of junk. <laughs> I want to use this <laughs> for, for any further descriptions of anything wrong. <laughs> That's a major flim flam. Wouldn't that mean that people hunting Bigfoot are big, big adventures? No. Okay, no. <laughs> no, no, uh, I think it's outrageous. 500 million for a painting. Like, there should not be value put on those things. Yeah, that's, that's just my opinion. But yeah, <laughs> that's mad. I think it's fake art news. Real in drag. Then it turns up in America? In New Orleans? Oh, I see. I think we've wished this Da Vinci into existence. Here's the lost Leonardo that somebody once mentioned in a book. Provenance has gotten <laughs> a lot easier over time. You used to have to track down books and read catalogs and stuff, but now it's all online. Control plus F, there it is. So you see, kid, there's nothing online. Nothing. Tell me who you bought this from, you son of a bitch. Where did you get this? Tell me the name of the auction house that sold you it. Connoisseurship. Look at the work. Do you believe what you are seeing? How does it look? How does it taste? Are these oh, ballpoint point no. pen strokes those of a master artist? Luckily, there are people like Martin Kemp, who spend their whole careers focusing on single artists. Mm -hmm. I've been dealing with Leonardo for, I suppose, about 50 years. They can pick out the fakes. So, for example, when he was looking at La Bella Principessa, he went, yep, he uses the Trois Crayon. He's a left-handed artist. The proportions of the head and the face are all correct. You know what? 
I'm going to give this a big rubber stamp right there in the middle of the painting. Confirmed. <laughs> so, for the fakers, they have to have a keen understanding of who they are copying. One of the best fakers, Almir Dahore, for example. Yeah, Mar- yes, that's the guy. He, he is crazy. He is insane. Like, personally, uh, the, the, the drawing styles that I've tried to emulate sometime when I used to draw a lot has been more anime uh, because, yeah, just my infatuation with manga lines. But, wow, the fact that this guy can basically just copy everyone, all the goats, is insane. He knows the strokes to a T. Pause. <laughs> and yeah, he's amazing. Mastered the brushstrokes of artists such as Matisse, Mogdiliani, and Renoir so well that hundreds of museums are currently in possession of his works without even knowing it. Yeah. Yes, well, Michelangelo was famous for his congiante painting techniques, and I can't see any of that here. You're zero for two, kid. You're going down. Forensics. <laughs> Taskmaster. going straight to the lab. Yeah. You're about to have a paint brush up with the law (laughs) masterpiece more like you're a real masterpiece (laughs) shit kid (laughs) (laughs) all right now the people that solve murders yo my man is wild he killed a kid (laughs) shit kid Oh, that's funny. (laughs) All right, now the people that solve murders have really changed the game when it comes to art forgeries by implementing radiocarbon dating. Yeah. Radiocarbon dating. Finding the right isotopes. Yeah, but it's not serious. Listen, you're made out of carbon. I'm made out of carbon. Paintings are made out of carbon. And when a thing is made out of carbon, there are these unusual isotopes of carbon-14, right? They're floating all throughout the air and the atmosphere. Now, all living things contain a trace of them. Yep. They are taken in when something eats, breathes, anything else. And that happens continuously throughout the life cycle. However, when the organism dies, it stops taking in new carbon, right? Which means mm-hmm. it stops Do taking in new carbon-14. Same thing happens to a painting. You've stopped putting paint on the thing, no more carbon. Carbon-14 is an unstable isotope, and it decays at a very steady rate. It turns into nitrogen-14 and a beta particle. Yeah. And because these (laughs) carbon-14 atoms decay at a very steady rate, in principle, you can look at the proportional number of carbon-14 atoms and determine how old something is. That's a very, very good explanation. It's simple. I would have done the same. More carbon-14, newer painting. Less carbon-14, older Older painting. painting. In 1985, using this technique, they caught a guy, Robert Trotter, who forged a Sarah Hon painting. Ah, far too many carbon-14 atoms. Hmm. Lock them up, boys. But there are even simpler methods of testing the age of a pigment. Three Jackson Pollock paintings were found to be fake when it was determined that the pigments on the canvas weren't sold until the 1960s. Oh. But Pollock was dead by 1956. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, there are huge pigment libraries that can be easily cross-referenced. Also, you can just blast most of them by doing radiographies and or just... Uh, um, AR scans, like what a fucking Batman goggles. Uh, yeah. Yeah, ju- just getting through it because there are different layers that you can uh, that you can detect there. So that shows the year a pigment was first introduced and what year it stopped being used. Hmm. For example, anything that has titanium white has to have been produced in the last 80 years. I'm going to be honest with you, kid. Michelangelo never used the yellow Crayola. <laughs> X-rays. Now, you can blast this thing with some radiation and look behind the painting to see what's underneath. For example, did the artist do a sketch first? Maybe this is painted over something else. If you look behind the Mona Lisa, a big ass head. She had a much larger head once. (laughs) Yeah, we got to see that in the museum as well. (laughs) It was kind of funny. Although maybe it just shrunk with age. 
And you can see that veil much more easily. Also, if you x-ray even further, you can see her fully formed <laughs> skeleton. But the art forgers of today are a wily bunch. Forgers can source old canvases from the correct period. They can use error matching pigments. Even mm. the carbon dating can be a bit unreliable. Heck, even the x-rays can be bullshitted, as forgers take into account that their work will be x-rayed, and uh, as they do a sort of fake painting or sketch first, and then paint the next version on top. That's why. All right, kid. I'll give you $20,000 for this, or a shiny new bottle of Ritalin. <laughs> He's smart for doing this. He's actually mad for doing this. <laughs> yeah, um, those of you who know, uh, I, I I don't have ADHD, but this is a medication that I most likely should have taken because of my uh, sleep disorder. But yeah, <laughs> Ritalin is, is the one medication that many people with ADHD are on. Ah, works every time. Fucking great. <laughs> this section is about Shakespeare. Wow, that would make so much sense for it to be in the theatre video on the main channel. Yeah, which this you didn't do. This showed up and changed the game. Shakespeare. Here's the thing, though. We basically know nothing about him. First, we don't know what he looked like. There are two best guesses. One mm -hmm. is from this engraving on a first folio. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't put together until seven years after he was already dead. One of his peers, Ben Johnson, knew him though and said, Yeah, yeah it's kind of look close. like him. <laughs> so maybe. The second is a bust that was made for his grave. There are a bunch of others, but they weren't commissioned by Shakespeare himself. They weren't done while he was alive, and he didn't exactly stop to pose for them. But these are the ones we most recognize him by. This includes Chandos, which is probably the most recognizable. <laughs> so this could be him, or this could be some completely other dude, or it could be an idealized version. Now, we also don't know exactly when he his was birthday. born, or yeah. when he died, or how he died. His birthday is celebrated on the 23rd of April, but there's no record of that. And then he died on the 23rd of April as well. So he died on his birthday, odd coincidence, but we know that he did marry a lady named Anne Hathaway. Yes, yep, the actual same cat woman. woman <laughs> but this one was the original. We also don't even really know how to spell his name. There are tons of different signatures by him, but they're practically all spelt differently. And let's not even get started on the conspiracies of whether or not he really wrote his plays. The son of two illiterate parents from a lower class Becomes neighborhood biggest... suddenly becoming the world's greatest playwright. Hmm, bit suspicious. Also, whether he was gay, or worse, whether he was foreign. Or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's ideas about that. Like, it's incredible how many people are going, the lengths that people are going to, like, ascertain who is who, who has ownership of a guy who's dead. Like, how about you just enjoy his work? The same thing as being, like, the dispute of... Uh, now a little bit of a different character with uh, Columbus, yeah. Because we were again bringing up that trip again where we visited the whole uh, Milan, and uh, we were traveling around uh, Europe, and we went later on to both Portugal and and Spain, where of course if you've seen that one, uh, oh, La, La, La Playa. What what is it called again? Well, that that big stretch of uh, market road in the, the center of Barcelona, there's like the Columbus statue, like a huge monument dedicated to him, and many people were like stories you could hear actually arguing about his origin. Like some people are saying that he's Portuguese, and some are saying no, no, he's obviously Spanish, and some are saying that. He's Italian. What, what are you on about? So, like, it's like, uh, yeah, are you actually fighting about the legacy of this guy? <laughs> Come on. What the hell is going on with his grave? So, if you go to the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford, there is his grave. There he lays. But there is an engraving above him 
Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he who moves Moves my my bones. bones. Cursed, you see. You're not allowed to dig him up. So everyone is super spooked out by the curse, and they refuse to dig him up. So archaeologists instead have done radar scans. Turns out, his head is missing. He was grave robbed in 1794. So we can't even reconstruct him that way. And they won't open it up for DNA tests. So it's likely that we will never know the truth. (laughs) Oh, you mad lad. I'm half expecting something like this, but it's good. (laughs) It's good. The government is hiding something. The point is, Shakespeare stole a theatre at one point. Okay. For those who didn't get this, this is most likely a spoof to uh, the whole Queen Cleo- Cleopatra uh, in her supposed biopic by Will Smith's wife, who depicted Cleopatra as not being of yeah the way that she actually would look like, despite all the evidence pointing towards something else. The biggest argument that always gets used about this is that we did never see her grave. We don't know where she's actually been buried, so we can't know that she was actually not looking like a, a person of actual, like, Egyptian descent, to which I'm like, are you, are you serious? <laughs> what about all, all the paintings of the time? What about her lineage, her entire family? But yeah, that was the joke that he made there. A quick Shakespeare moment. In 1599, Shakespeare was working as a playwright with his acting troupe called The Lord Chamberlain's Men. Now, they were leasing out a theatre in Shoreditch called The Theatre. Mm-hmm. Creative name. Anyway, they had a disagreement with the landlord, Giles Allen. Giles revoked their lease. Shakespeare and the Chamberlain's men were not very happy about that, but they had no option but to walk away. Oh. But a few days later, in the dead of night, they came back. Now, the group met up just outside the theatre, and they had bribed the watchmen to look the other way. Then, with daggers and tools in hand, they broke into the theatre. Now, they weren't there to kill giants, and they weren't there to steal stuff from the theatre. No. They were there to rob the theater. They tore down the entire building, piece by piece, and they started carting it away to a warehouse. From there, they ferried it across the Thames and over to Southwark. With the materials that they stole, they constructed (laughs) the Globe Theater. What? And there it stood for the next 14 years until it burned down. down. It was a performance of Henry VIII, and a prop cannon was involved. Don't worry about that. But then it was rebuilt. But then in 1642, it was shut down again. But in 1997, <laughs> a recreation of the Globe Theatre was made once more. And in- That's wild. That's wild. <laughs> they, stole, they stole materials. <laughs> Yo, fuck you. We're going to steal your theatre. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Yo. We, we're not going to defraud you. We're gone. We are not here to steal your valuables. No, we are here to steal your, your house. That's next level. London, you can visit it today. As long as you can avoid Shakespeare's 11. <laughs> being stabbed. And now for the best section of all. Come on, people, we're ready to shoot. Where's the pizza box with the hole in it? <laughs> oh, never mind, that's my cue. I gotta go. Catch you soon. Don't forget NordVPN. Bruh. Yo, Anthony historian. <laughs> that's some strange thing that you're engaging in there at the end. If <laughs> Oh my God, I'm only fan of Anthony's historian. Just memes plastered everywhere.